Hello brothers and sisters of Christ, the whosoever clause. We're going to be talking about today uh, about forced salvation, where people are trying to force God to save them. Okay? The whosoever clause. Uh, turn to Romans 10, 13. Turn to Romans 10, 13 in your King James Bible. This is the second attempt to do this video. We got started just a few minutes into the, to in the video and we lost power. The rain is here, brother says Christ. The rain is here. We're heading into our winter here, and our winter is it gets very windy, it gets very rainy, and we have trees that where the limbs are dead during the summer, they're dead, and then when it starts raining, a lot of that water starts soaking into the wood that's dried out, and the wood gets twice as heavy, and the limb breaks and falls, and if it falls on one of our power lines out here, we're without power for a while until somebody comes out and fixes it. Um, so that's, the, that's what we're in right now, brothers and Christ. Got a lot of wind, got a lot of rain. We desperately need the rain. We need water out here every winter. And it's just how God set up the seasons. Praise the Lord. But your King James Bibles, make sure you're getting your King James Bibles, God's perfect written word in English. Make sure you're getting this. Make sure that you're reading it, you're praying over it, and that you're believing it, hiding it in your heart. That's what this is all about, okay? So, may, I also want to point out real quick, Bibles, King James Bibles. Brothers and sisters of Christ, if you need a King James Bible, newly saved, and you need a King James Bible and you can't afford one, I mean, you can afford a cheap one, but if you want somewhat of a nice one that'll last you a lifetime, or you have bought one of those cheap ones, which is okay, God's Word's God's Word, but it's starting to fall apart. I've got books in there, like old books, and the paper isn't as strong, and it's not leather, Okay. But if you need a King James Bible, email this ministry. Okay, even if you need a replacement. Okay. Uh, I was talking with the Lord and I slipped up and said that if you need a new King James Bible, I'm like, oh no, 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 no. Don't get a new King James Bible. That is garbage, it's filth. What I was meant to say was is a King James Bible that is new. Okay. You might already have one, it's fallen apart, and you're like, yeah, it'd be time to get another one, but I can't afford one. By all means, email this ministry, okay? And uh, we will do our best with what God has blessed us with. Um, and we'll do our best to try to get you a King James Bible, okay? That's God's perfect written word. This is what you hold me accountable to, brothers and Christ. It's what I hold you accountable as a professing, Bible-believing, God-fearing man, a Christian man according to the Scriptures, okay? This is our final authority, brothers and Christ. This is how we live our life. As we're going to get into this study, this is what people are trying to do away with. This is what I'm all about, brothers and Christ. I want you to take God's Word. I want you to hold on to it, hide it in your heart. I don't want you letting it go. In these last days, we have the great falling away, and we see a lot of people letting go. This world, this Word is not taking priority anymore. This is our final authority, brothers and Christ. Please hold on to it. So Romans 10.13, I heard a uh, preacher once say, he'll quote this scripture, Romans 10.13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, and I heard that preacher and he's like, he, he does a scenario, he's like, well, or God looked down at me, and he used his name, and said, God looked down at me and said, hmm, I didn't want to save that man, but... He followed the whosoever clause. I have no choice. I have to save him. Is that truth? We're going to find out in this study today. That's a lie. That's a total lie. There's no such thing as a what whosoever clause. What's going on here? you got people that are trying to force God to save them. I'm going to get ahead of myself. They don't want to come to God on His terms and do things His way. They try to find loopholes in the Word of God. They try to find loopholes where they can say, well, I won't do the, everything, follow all the steps that God said to take. I'll just do this one, and God's forced to save me. Or I'll just do that one, and God is forced to save me. And you know the number one step they always try to leave out, brother, sister Christ? If you said it, <laughs> then you guessed right if you said this. Repentance. That's the number one thing they always try to avoid. They always try to take repentance out. And then they say, God, you are forced to save me. Is that true? Okay. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See? For whosoever. The whosoever clause. 
Well, let me ask you a question. And then we're going to get in the scripture to see what the, who the whosoever really is. But if someone has not or refuses to repent, someone has it yet or refuses to repent, and they refuse to believe how Jesus, how Christ died for us, died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. They refuse to believe this. But they call out and say, God, if you're out there, I need some help. If you guys don't know what that was, I was listening to one of Peter Ruckman's testimony. God, save me. Oh, wait, I heard that God, who's that other name that, that's associated with God? Oh, yeah, Jesus, Jesus save me. Does God have to save that person? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. They've made a wreck of their life. Everything's fallen apart. Save me. I've heard lost people do this, brother says Christ. Well, they'll yell out to God, God, if you're out there, I need some help. God, I need to be saved. I need saved. Look at my mess that I've made. I need help. God, if you're out there. Yeah, they've called upon the name of the Lord. Jesus, save me. Okay. Are they saved? Well, does God force to save them? That's something to think about. The answer is no. God is not forced to save them. That preacher, I didn't want to, God saying, I didn't want to save that man. I didn't want to save him. But because of the whosoever clause, I had no choice. What is this? This is them trying to be, it's like a sales pitch, trying to get more people into the Babel building. There's a Babel building preacher, trying to get more people in the Babel building. Why? Because what's the number one thing? I'm getting ahead of myself again. What's the number one thing this world loves to do? Well, sin. But when it comes to salvation, they love to try to find any other door but the right one. They'll do anything and everything to try to keep their sin, not have to repent, to remain, keep them themselves as the final authority, not having to sacrifice their freedoms, their, their themselves as an authority at the cross. They don't want to do that. So what they do, they spend their whole life trying to find other doors. But who is this whosoever? 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're supposed to rightly divide if I just grab that verse by itself, it does sound like that. It sounds like, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God's forced to save people. The whosoever, all they have to do is say, Jesus, save me. And that's it. No repentance, no belief, no confession. Just, God save me. Jesus save me. That's it. But we are taught, brother says Christ, that we're supposed to rightly divide. Go back to, Ro stay in Romans chapter 10, but let's go back to verse 1 and let's read that whole chapter and see what all is implied as it leads up to the whosoever. I know it's hard for some of these men in the Babel buildings. It is. Because they don't want to rub people the wrong way. Like, upset them. Okay? No. They don't want to upset them. Now, Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God for Israel is that they might be saved. Okay, that's, that's uh, Paul's desire. That's also God's desire. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, Jesus Christ, doing things God's way, going through Jesus Christ. And going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves into the righteousness of, righteousness of God. The Jewish people are still trying to do works to earn their way to heaven. Okay? They're still trying to, they're not doing it now, but they're, at this time that this was going on, they were still doing, when Paul wrote this, they were still doing animal sacrifices. They weren't going through Jesus Christ on the cross, it is finished, they were still doing animal sacrifices. Okay. They were still doing all the different sacrifices and having to wash the hands and all this stuff. Verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. 
And stop right there. People will say, I'm stretching, but brother says Christ, the Bible says, rightly dividing. It says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. What's the laws? The laws of God. It's his commandment. What's the whole duty of man? Fear God and keep his commandments. What are the laws? God's commandments. The do's and the don'ts when it comes to this life down here. The do's and the don'ts. Did we break those commandments? Yes. That's called sin. We did a whole study on this. That's what sin is. Going against God's commandments. Okay. What are law? Let's go back to the law again. What's the law again, brother says Christ? The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Why? Because the law lets us know that we are sinners. And the law lets us know the consequences of said sin. We're going to go to hell and then have tossed in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. Because we've broken God's commandments. The laws. God's laws. And when you sin against God and the laws are schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, what does it mean? It means that we have to repent. Repentance entered in. Mankind has to start repenting the moment sin entered the world. Adam and Eve. We did a study on this showing how God gave Adam and Eve opportunity after opportunity to repent. God gives mankind a chance to repent. Anytime there's sin present, you have a chance to repent. There's repentance that can, that can be present. Okay. For Christ is the end of the law for, uh, for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. What was Paul preaching? Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. To the Jews first and then to the Gentiles, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. As we keep going, then, then we see the confession. Repentance and belief happen in the heart. I'm not going to go into it too much. I've got other videos proving this. The lost world tries to turn repentance into a work so that they can avoid doing it. They don't want to do things God's way. They want to do things their way. They want to hold on to their own authority, their flesh being in charge. And the Bible says that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. They don't want to please God. They want to please themselves. They want to do away with repentance. But the word of faith which they preached was repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We always bring this up, brothers, to Christ. It's like, why did Jesus die? If repentance isn't involved, why did Jesus die then? Remember? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, how that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Hello? Repentance. You come to God saying, He died for my sins. I deserve to do, go through what He went through. It's my fault. Lord, I am so sorry. It's there. But people don't want to see it. They don't want to give up their, their flesh. They don't want to give up their authority. They don't want to give up their so-called rights, freedoms. They don't want someone else in charge of their life. They want to be in charge of their life. Verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There's where we got the confession. The heart. It happens in the heart. But the heart man believeth unto righteousness. The heart man comes to God broken. And true repentance, having godly sorrow, sorrow towards God for your personal sins. For Jesus Christ doing what he did, God manifest in the flesh, doing what he did on the cross because of you, personally. And you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that it's God's blood that was shed on the cross. He was buried and rose again the third day, proving that he is God Almighty. 
And that His blood can wash your sins away. Because His blood is God's blood. Confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on Him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We just went through there and we're able to tie in all the steps of salvation. Repentance, belief, the faith which we preach. Repentance and belief. Then it said you're to confess them. When someone's come to that point, that's the whosoever. There's no clause involved. That's the whosoever. God looks at the heart. Okay. There's a lot of people trying to deceive God. God looks at the heart. And if your heart isn't right with the Lord, repentance, belief, confession, you can call out all you want. He won't save you. Not that He doesn't want to save you. He won't save you unless you come to Him on His terms. Sacrificing, giving your life to Jesus Christ at the cross. That's what I mean. Have you sacrificed your rights? Your, your own right to be your own authority? Your freedoms at the cross. You give your whole life, the old man at the cross, saying, Doing th when I'm in authority, I'm on my way to hell. When I want my freedoms of the flesh, it leads me to hell. My way leads to hell. I'm throwing that my way at the foot of the cross, and now, Lord, I'm doing things your way. You're in charge. Lead me. Command me. You see how that works? But people don't want to do that. Verse 14, How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Getting saved is a good thing. Throwing the old man at the foot of the cross and letting God come in and clean up your life is a good thing. The Bible says that we are without, when we were lost, we were without hope and without God in the world. We're on our way to hell, and we deserve to go to hell, and that was our destination. We were worthless. Our life was meaningless until God came into our life. We were without hope and without God in the world. Now we have hope. What's that hope? That blessed hope. I am get to go to heaven when I die. But until then, I need to be living for Jesus Christ. But I have that hope. The reason I'm living a life of Christ, the reason I'm trusting this book, hiding it in my heart, and living it, is because someday I'm going to have to stand before my Savior, who is the Lord God Almighty, to be judged one day. And for me as a saved sinner, I'm going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. My life as a Christian is going to be thrown on the altar and burnt up. All the good works are survive, all the bad works won't. The bad works, people say it was just bad work. Uh, sin is a bad work. Turning your back on this book is a bad work. Leading people astray for men in ministry is a bad work. They always think, you know, if they, have to, they try not to equate sin with it. Uh, yeah, sin has a part to play in the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? But peace. I never really knew peace, brother, sister, Christ, till I truly got saved. You know, there's people out there that can try to fake the peace. In front of other people, they try to act like they're, they're they they have peace and everything, but they don't. They don't. This world doesn't know what real peace is. True peace that only God can give. True joy that only God can give. True happiness that only God can give. The evidence of that, brother, sister, Christ. You have testimonies. I have testimonies of when I'm hit. Rock bottom, the lowest point in my walk with the Lord, where everything around you seems to fall apart, whether it's your fault that they're falling apart, and you have to repent and get your heart right with the Lord, or the lost world's coming in and just attacking you. But through it all, when you get your heart, if it's your fault, you get your heart right with the Lord, and through it all, if it's the world's fault, through it all, God will give you peace. The lost world goes crazy. The lost world goes nuts. The lost world wants to kill themselves. When they get that depressed, that down. They want to blame everybody else. They're just, they're, they're out of control. They don't know peace. True peace. 
How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. What's going on? You have people trying to skip things, steps, procedures. They're trying to skip repentance. They skip repentance and then they try to find a loophole in the Bible and say it's a clause and God has to save me now. You, you're forced to save me, Lord. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But people like to add to the scripture, it's a clause, it's a clause. Repent, believe, confess both in prayer. That equals verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. That's the whosoever. You come to God broken. As a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on your way to hell for sinning against him and having sorrow for that sin. You're sorry for this wicked state. I don't want this wicked state anymore. But I can't do anything about it of my own. I don't have the authority and I don't have the strength. But God does. God provided a way. And that's where you turn and look at the cross. Lord, you sacrificed your son you shed your blood on the cross to pay for my sins. I was not worthy. I'll never be worthy. It's a gift. It's God's grace. It's God's mercy. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, for being merciful to me, a sinner. You've got to come to God like that. And then you confess both in prayer to God, and then you qualify for the whosoever. And the thing is, Lord, that's tell you that uh, God is forced to save you. God is not forced to save you, Brother Sis Christ. He wasn't forced to save me. He's not forced to save anyone. Sorry about that. Forgot to unplug the phone. <laughs> He's not forced to save you. He's not forced to save me. He's not forced to save anyone. That takes away from God's grace and God's mercy and God's love. He chooses to, brother, sister, Christ. Uh, Exodus 33:19. Turn to Exodus 33:19. Sometimes we jump to the Old Testament. Exodus 30. Genesis. Exodus 33:19. Exodus 33:19. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Okay. Now turn to Romans 9.17, or 9.15. Back to the New Testament. Romans 9.15. For he saith to Moses, Romans 9, 15, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. You don't force God. Okay. I remember, if you read the story about Moses, there was a time where God was like, I'm done with the Jewish people. They've upset me to the point where I'm going to just wipe them out and start all over with you, Moses. And Moses is like, oh, please, Lord, have compassion. Please forgive them. And he did. The Jewish people, Moses pleaded for him. They were so pleading for him. See, that's a sign of what God does for us through Jesus Christ. He's pleading for us, but this is Christ. We don't deserve it. We deserve to go to hell. But he's pleading for us. Right? But brother, this is Christ. He will have compassion on whom he will have compassion. Okay? Romans 9.18, go down a few verses. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. He'll have mercy on whom he will have mercy. Right? That's the verse I was thinking of in the, in the other study, but I said the last half wrong. Okay? 
He'll have mercy on whom he'll have mercy. And I couldn't remember the last part. I couldn't think if it was he'll have wrath on whom he'll have wrath, which is true, but it's not in the verse. Um, it talks about his wrath being on the, child, uh, the children of disobedience. He'll have wrath on he will have wrath on. He'll have mercy on whom he will have mercy. You read the story of Jonah. Jonah got upset because God didn't pour his wrath out on those people. Nineveh, the people of Nineveh. Why? They repented. And Jonah's like, oh, you should have poured your wrath on. God will pour his wrath out on whom he will pour his wrath out on. But I said that verse wrong. Okay? So please forgive me, brother, says Christ. Therefore he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. God's the one who has mercy. Romans 12, 19. There's tons of verses on this, but I just grabbed a few. 12, 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will pay, saith the Lord. God will have vengeance on whom he will have vengeance. He'll have wrath on whom he will have wrath. He'll have mercy on whom he will have mercy. God's the one that does what he does. You cannot force God to have vengeance on somebody. Jonah didn't like those Ninevites, uh, the, the people of Nineveh, because of how they treated the Jewish people. You have to do the story, uh, read the story in the Old Testament before you get to, Nove uh, to uh, Jonah, where it talks about Nineveh and its relationship to the Jewish people. Okay? God will have vengeance on whom he will have vengeance. Okay, God will have wrath on whom he will have wrath, and God will save who he wants to save. God is not forced to save anyone, brother, sister, Christ. You cannot earn salvation with your vain belief, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. And we've talked about this plenty of times before, brother, sister, Christ. Today, in this day and age, the popular false gospel today is easy believism. They take repentance out and they've earned salvation with their faith. And God is forced to save them because they believe. God's forced to save them. And when you read 1 Corinthians 15, the whole chapter, that belief that's in vain is that they are not living a resurrected life. The old man is not, they didn't throw the old man at the foot of the cross. They didn't come to God repenting. They're still their own boss. They're still their own final authority. Their flesh is still in charge. And their life is rejecting Jesus Christ raising from the dead. Because as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, we should walk in newness of life. We have a new life with Jesus Christ. There's no new life there. You're rejecting the resurrection with the life that you're living. Your belief isn't in vain. You're not saved. But today people are trying to say, oh, it's, it's only believe, only believe. You don't have to repent. There is no changed life. You can continue in the flesh even though the Bible says they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Why were we created, brother and Christ? To please God. But you don't have to please God. You don't have to, you know, give your life to Jesus Christ. You just have to believe. That belief is vain. What is this? It's all about forcing salvation. Okay. Uh, same thing with the whosoever clause, the so-called whosoever clause. What is that? It's all about forcing God to save someone who didn't repent. It's all about doing away with repentance. God is not forced to save anyone, brother says Christ. Guess what? He wants to, though. Brother says Christ, we know it. We've been through it. We followed the proper steps in the Bible. God saved us, gave us a new life. There's times where I fail Him. As a saved sinner, I fail Him sometimes. I get off the right path, and I go to the right, or I go to the left, and God has to bring me back to the path. Absolutely. But God's given me a new life, and my life predominantly is on that path. I pray yours is too, and you're not falling to the left or to the right, brother and sister Christ. He's not forced to save you, but He wants to. Okay. 2 Peter 3 9. 2 Peter 3 9. A lot of you know this one. 2 Peter 3 9. Okay. 
2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish. You know, he doesn't want people to go to hell, Brother Jesus Christ, mankind, his creation. He doesn't want mankind going to hell. You know who what hell who hell was created for? The Bible says the hell was created for the devil and his angels. He's not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want people to go to hell, but that all should come to repentance. It's always the first step to get in your heart right with the Lord in every dispensation of this book. The first step has always been repentance. To get your heart right with the Lord. Repentance has always been there. I say every dispensation except for eternity future, but you do wrong, you repent. You sin against God, you repent. It's always there. But all of a sudden, for this, and a lot of the people, the easy believism, they don't believe in dispensational teaching. So they ignore God commanding people to repent all throughout the Bible and say, it's just believe, only believe, only believe. They leave out repentance. But he doesn't want us to go to hell. He doesn't want us to perish. He wants man, his creation, mankind, to get saved. How do you get saved today? By obeying the gospel. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You confess both in prayer, and you ask God to save you. That's the whosoever. When you ask God to save you, did you repent? Did you believe? Right? If you didn't repent, that belief's going to wind up being in vain, because you're not going to have a life, a new life. You're not going to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. You have to repent, believe, confess, hope, and prayer. That's the whosoever. And it's not a clause saying God has to save you. No. He wants to save you, brother, says Christ. And he did. If you're truly saved God's way, the Bible way, he saved you and he wanted to save you. He wasn't forced. What's going on with all this forcing to be saved? Forcing to God has to save you. God has to. We're going to get into that. Turn to John 3.16. John 3.16. Another example that God wants to save people. The famous John 3.16. What do we always say about John 3.16? If you're going to read John 3.16, you need to keep reading all the way through to 21. But they don't. They just read John 3.16. And, and that's it. What's John 3.16? For God so loved past tense, past event, at the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You want God's love? You have to go to the cross. You have to repent and go to the cross. Mm -hmm. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, like I said, it's not that God doesn't want to save you. He wants to save you. But he's not forced to save us. But that the world through him might be saved. Not everybody's going to get saved. And we know this. Right? God is not forced to save anyone. He wants to save someone. He wanted to save me. He wanted to save you, brothers and sisters in Christ out there that are saved. If you're lost watching this, he wants to save you. But you've got to come to the foot of a cross, throwing your old man, throwing your rights, your sin, your wickedness, your right to sin, your right to do whatever you want, you being the final authority. You've got to throw that at the foot of the cross and say, Lord, save me. I'm yours. Lord, save me. You are the commander in chief. You are God Almighty. Save me. You're in charge. You've got to come to that point. God does not want anyone to go to hell. But he will send people to hell. Without batting an eyelash, he will send people to hell. Okay. Now why do, people, why do people try to skip repentance and try to find loopholes to force God to save them? 
And that's what this all this is, this movement in these Babel buildings. It's all moving towards easy believism. It's all to moving towards you've earned salvation. You can find a loophole and force God to save you. Well, if you keep reading, like I said before, we've got to keep reading. John 3.18, why do people try to force a loophole? Why do they try to force their way upon God? In other words, they try to get God to conform to how they want it. They won't conform to God's way. They won't do things God's way. They don't want a perfect written word of God that shows us His way. Because if there's no perfect written word of God, who's to say what's God's way? I can make it up and get God to conform to me. The world. And, get, and I can do things my way. John 3.18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he believeth... But for he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. They don't want to repent. They like their flesh being in charge. They love their sin. They love the worldliness. They don't want to repent. They love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. You come to Jesus Christ on the cross, that light, that cross, think of that cross as one big beacon of light that just shines on your life, how wicked your life is. Jesus paid for that. How wicked and filthy you are. People don't want that. They don't want that. They don't want repentance. They don't want to be sh their life being shown for what it truly is. And today, brothers of Christ, you have people saying, well, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. But they still don't want that light shining on their life because if they shine on their life, you'd see how, just how wicked of a sinner they are. That they're hiding from you. That they're trying to hide from God. I'm not that bad. I'm a sinner, but I'm not that bad. Oh, yes, you are. Ten times worse than what you're making yourself out to be. Talk about this man right here. I had to come to him. I was a false convert for most of my life. I actually had to come to God broken in true biblical repentance. I was taught repentance was just going from unbelief to belief. That's a lie. That's a total lie. All right? It's coming to God having sorrow for your personal sins that you sinned against him that put him on the cross. That's what true biblical repentance is. Neither come to the light lest his deed should be reproved. But he that doeth truth... Cometh to the light. I want the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I want Jesus shining his light on me. I need to come to him broken and throw that old man at the foot of the cross. I need that light on me, showing me how wicked and convicting me of sin to bring me to the cross. I want that truth. You get to that point where you want the truth. But he that doeth the truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are a rotten God. You're following God's steps. You're doing what God has commanded us to do. You're obeying the gospel. And after salvation, this still applies for someone who's saved after salvation. What do we say about sin? What's the number one thing that sin does? Sin, of course, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. There's consequences to sin, but in my experience with my walk with the Lord, when I start getting back into sin and wickedness, and I start getting back into worldliness, okay, I didn't get life. God did not just clean up my life like that, brother Jesus Christ. It took years to get my life to where it is now. Uh, I've been saved for over eight years now. Praise the Lord. But you know what sin does? It puts a wall between these, this and you. This gets put down when you start getting into sin. I've noticed that in my life. It starts gathering dust. You know what else sin does? It prevents your praying. Why? Because if I start reading this, and I start praying, what happens? That he that doeth the truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. This will shine a light on that evil sin that I'm doing and convict me. Don't, don't, God's not deceived, brother says Christ. Don't, don't lie. I'm not lying to you today. The number one reason why it's hard when I fall back into sin and wickedness and I start going down the wrong path, what does it do? It gets me to put this down because my flesh is telling me that if I pick this up, guess what's going to happen? God's going to start convicting me of that sin that I'm doing. 
don't pray that much, or, you know, you'll, you'll get around to praying eventually. Oh, that book's there. It's always there. You'll, you'll get around to it eventually. You'll get around to prayer eventually. What happens when you start praying? The Holy Spirit in you bears witness with your conscience. What you're doing is wrong. That's the life of a Christian. The lost world doesn't want that kind of relationship with God. They don't want that relationship with God. So what do they do? They try to find the back door. Still getting ahead of myself a little bit. Okay? God has their number. Turn to 2 Timothy 3.1. 2 Timothy 3.1. These people that they don't want that light shining on their life. They don't. They want to play religion. They like to play part of a club. They want to have an insurance of going to heaven when they die, but they don't want to give their life to Jesus Christ. They want to just live it up down here and live however they want to live. Apart from this book. 2 Timothy 3, 3, 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. God's got their number. Brothers is Christ, He's shown us. Sometimes it's not easy. Brothers is Christ, you need to be quick. I'll say this. I've failed this. I failed the Lord. Sometimes I'm quick to judge salvation. People say, well, you're not, you don't have any right to judge salvation. Paul says, prove your own selves. You have to prove it. Check whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. If any man be in Christ, if a man be called a brother. Okay. Yes, you are to prove yourself. But brothers says Christ, we need to take some time to investigate a little bit further. They can be messed up in the flesh. They can be someone that was on the right path that went to the left or the right. They can be part of the falling away. We need to take time and stop being lazy and being quick to judge. The Bible also warns about judging on the outward appearance. The reason why it says that is, is that we need to judge righteous judgment. Judge not on the outward appearance, but judge righteous judgment. We need to investigate. If we see something wrong with somebody that professes to be saved, we need to investigate. They might be newly saved, and God's just starting to clean up their life. Okay? They might have been deceived into leaving the narrow path and going to the right or to the left. Give them the truth. They don't want the truth. We've planted a seed. Get back to living for the Lord. Stay, we're staying on the straight and narrow. If that person doesn't want to come from the left or the right and go back on the straight and narrow path, God will deal with them. But we need to be careful. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of false converts out there, and I'll call people out for being false converts. And I've said this before, but there's just Christ. It's not, you shouldn't be ashamed of doing this. If you have someone that you believe is saved that's gotten so messed up, fallen to the left, fallen to the right, you should never be ashamed to look at them and preach the gospel to them. Even if you believe they're saved, you preach the gospel to them. You remind them who it is that saved them. Who it is, why they got saved, why they needed to get saved, who it is that saved them, and who it is that's supposed to be in charge. Not the world. Not the flesh, and not Satan. Those are the three enemies. These are the three enemies that get you to go to the right and get you to go to the left. And when you've gone to the right, to the left, it's because you put one of those three things in charge. And not God and His Word. Never be ashamed to preach the gospel to someone who's saved. Never be ashamed. Okay? The last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. I can find a loophole and still love myself. I don't have to deny myself. I don't have to deny myself and come to the cross. Ah, no, I just believe. Only believe. I found a loophole. The only believe clause. The uh, whosoever clause. Lovers of their own selves. Covetous. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. The Bible says, be ye holy for I am holy. It's Jesus Christ. We're supposed to live a life of Christ. We're supposed to be in Christ Jesus. We're supposed to be following Jesus Christ. And he commands us on how to live and how to be holy today. We're not going to be perfect. This body of flesh is still sinful and wicked. But we're supposed to try. But you have these people that have a profession of faith. They're, like, they're not even trying. Their life is just unholy. They love their sin. They make excuses for their sin. They try to find loopholes in the Bible. 
or they just ignore the Word of God completely and go off of traditions of men, church fathers, uh, culture, heritage, feelings and opinions. It's so frustrating, brother says Christ. The attacks that I get, most of them, when they go, when I get to attack. They can't deal with what we're talking about in the study. They don't come up with, okay, I disagree with this in the study, and here's some scriptures that I think that prove what you're saying are wrong. They don't do that. They come with feelings and opinions and traditions of men and church fathers. This person said something, so I'm going to pair it with that person said, and they throw it in the comment section, but they don't have this as a foundation. They've been taught to get away from this as the foundation. Three, without natural affection. Okay. Well, you're being deceived today. A lot of the brethren, not a lot of them, but the world's being deceived today that you can be a sodomite and be a Christian. You can be a sodomite Christian. You can be a drunk, drunken Christian. You don't have to put away that sin. You know, they label sin and say you're a Christian, and, and they label it saying you can be a Christian. I'm a Christian who sins. Yes. But they try to use it as justification. You can be a sodomite Christian. No, 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 no. If you're truly saved and born again, God will get that out of your life immediately. You can't be an abomination in the sight of God and be a child of God. As far as salvation goes today. That's an abomination. Okay. But they try to deceive you. Like I said, they're always trying to find a back door. They always find some kind of clause. They're always trying to force God into saving them. When you get saved, after you get saved, God's going to get a lot of things out of your life fast. He got a lot of things out of my life fast. Got porn out of my life fast. He helped me with my language, my speech. Bad language got out of my life fast. All right. Brothers is Christ. There's things He will get us out of our lives fast when we get truly saved and born again. But the point is, is... My life belongs to him. He commands, I obey. These people that try to say, oh, you can be a sodomite and be a Christian. What's going on there? you got a man or a woman that says, I'm the final authority, and God has to save me, and I get to go to heaven when I die. But I'm going to live my way, and I'm going to do things my way, the flesh's way. That's what you got going on there. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Traitors. Okay, in order to be a traitor like Judas Iscariot, you once had to be part of the Twelve Apostles. Not us. I'm talking about you had to be part of something in order to turn against it and be a traitor. You mean there's brethren today that are be becoming traitors? Oh, yeah. Traitors. Heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. You cannot come to the cross, brothers and sisters, Christ, having love of pleasures more than lovers of God. And that's what's happening. People are just saying, I just believe. I just believe. I know I'm ranting a little bit, but please bear with me, brothers and sisters, Christ. Eight, I've been in ministry for five years now, and I've had to deal with this with some people. Okay? When you call them out for their sin... This is what I've done. When someone professes to be saved, I ask them, what does the Bible say about what you're doing there? What does the Bible say about how you're living? And what I get from them mostly, brothers and sisters Christ, the easy believism crowd that professes to be Christians, professes to be saved, when you call out their sin and wickedness according to the Scriptures, you know where they run to? They run to the cross. It's under the blood. I, I, don't, I, don't, have, I don't have to do works to be saved. We never said they were lost. We're correcting them as a saved sinner saying, now you're supposed to be living a life of Christ, and you're not living a life of Christ. And instead of them coming and re repenting and saying, you're right, I need to get my heart right with the Lord, I need to live for the Lord, they keep running to the cross, that clause, that clause, I can live however I want, it's under the blood, it's under the blood, they just quote that, it's under the blood. Yes, the Bible says that, but they abuse it. It's just under the blood. It's just under the blood. I can live however I want. They always run back to salvation and say, I'm not saved by works. Why would you do that? If someone came to me and said, hey, the Bible says this and you're not doing it, I'm not going to look at them and go, how dare you judge me? I'm under the blood. I'm saved. I'm under the blood. Why would I think automatically go straight to salvation? 
because that's someone who's not saved that does that. They think they found a loophole. They think they found a clause that God has to save them. So whenever they get pointed out that they are not lining up with the Lord and His Word, they just run back to that clause and hide, try to hide behind that clause. We'll have fun doing that at the great white throne. Okay? I like There's going to be a lot of people there that's going to try to act like they, they try to find that clause. Did we not do this for you, Lord? Did we not do that for you, Lord? Did we do uh, Depart from me, ye cursed, and their everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Depart from me, ye who work iniquity. I never knew you. God is not forced to save anyone. And if you're one of those people and you come across this video, you're one of those people that are hiding behind a clause saying God had to save me and I can live however I want, you need to come to the cross broken and you need to repent and then believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. You need to throw all your rights on the foot of the cross. God, you're in charge. Command me. The Bible says that we were bought with a price. Know ye not that you're not your own? Your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. Know ye not that you are not your own? You were bought with a price. But these people, they're not bought with a price. Nobody owns me. God doesn't own me. God doesn't tell me what to do. I do what I want to do. That's these people that always... But, but, but God has to save me because I believed. God has to save me. I did the whosoever clause. God has to save me. No, he does not. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Brothers and Christ, I'm going to keep going, but I'm going to stop for a second. The problem I'm seeing is it comes down to authority. You've got people that want to be their own authority. And you have those of us, brothers and sisters Christ, that came to God broken and said, My authorities lead me to hell. My way, my authority, my flesh, the world, Satan is trying to get me to go to hell. My way isn't doing it. Lord, I want your way. Lord, you, I want you to be the authority in my life. That's what it all comes down to, brother says Christ. Who's your authority? Is this your authority? Or is this your authority? Is the world your authority? Are you listening to Satan and his demons whispering in your ear and letting them be your final authority? Oh boy. Verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Brothers, we talked about this. What's the power thereof? The changed life. When you give, truly give your life to Jesus Christ, He's in command. He has all the authority. But you have people that have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Remember what repentance is. After you get saved, you're supposed to have fruits, meat for repentance. There's supposed to be good fruits that line up with this book that show that you repented before you got saved. This professing Christian world doesn't want that. They don't want to change life. They don't want, they love their sin. Like I said, they still want to be their own authority. They don't want for, they don't have fruits meet for repentance. So they have a form of godliness. Oh God, I did this for you. Oh God, I did that for you. I go to the Babel buildings and, and I do this. And I, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. From such, turn away. But and that's hard. But this is Christ. That is hard. I have family members who profess to be saved that are lost and on their way to hell. Most of them attack this book. They don't want anything to do with this book, the King James Bible. They've, they're part of the easy believism. I've earned salvation with my face. There's a clause. God has to save me because I believed. They refuse to repent. They refuse to give their life to Jesus Christ. Then you've had to turn away from them. I'm still, I still honor my mother and my father. I still do my best to help family member out when I can. But when it comes to this life, I've preached the gospel to them. I've preached the Bible version issue to them. I've preached the true plan of salvation. They do not want it. So when it comes to my life with the Lord, from such turn away. They have no part in it. They have no part in my life living for the Lord and my walk with the Lord. They have no part in it. 
And they shouldn't. Lost people should not have a part in your walk with the Lord. Other than the ministry of reconciliation, because someone's going to hit me up for that. We have the ministry of Re reconciliation. That's work we do for the Lord, preaching the gospel. But they're not supposed to have a part in our life. In other words, we're not supposed to be fellowshipping with the lost world. You don't pray with the lost world. You don't read this Bible to the lost world other than preaching the gospel. But I'm saying you don't talk about biblical things, doctrines, instruction, righteousness. You just let them know that they're sinners according to the Bible. And here's how, how you get saved. You're a sinner on your way to hell. And this is how you get saved. But you don't fellowship with the lost world. From such, turn away. They have a form of godliness, but they're not one of us. If you keep hanging out with them and you keep fellowshipping with them, what's going to happen? You're going to be pulled away to one of the three enemies. Your, your flesh, because that's how they're, they're flesh driven. They're carnally minded, walking after the flesh, so they can get you to start listening to your flesh. Okay? The world, they're all about the world's way, because the world's way is always contrary to the scriptures. It's taking God's word and perverting it so much that you can't even see God's word in it anymore. Especially today. They've perverted everything. And Satan, being asserted, the lost world is the enemy. Why? Because they're being used of Satan. When I was lost as a false convert, I was being used of Satan. They're trying to pull you the wrong direction if you hang out with them. You're not to fellowship with them. And I've said this before. There's, I used to... With my mom, I used to be her movie buddy. We'd go out every Friday night when a new movie came out that was interesting. We'd go out and watch it. I got saved, truly saved and born again. I went out and watched a movie with her where some guy was getting in a dress and sneaking into some museum dressed as a woman, a maid that's cleaning the place. He's dressing like a sodomite. They're pushing sodomy. And that just rubbed... I had the Holy Spirit in me. The Spirit, I just... When I was lost, I had no problem with it. I'd laugh about it. But now that I'm saved, that ain't quite, that ain't right. You know what my mom would say? She'd say, well, you know, it, it was okay because he had to do that to sneak into, and she started justifying it. That's the world's way. The world's way justifies sin. You hang around those people long enough, guess what's going to happen? They're going to start rubbing off on you, and you are going to start justifying sin. From such, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. What does Satan do? Satan goes after the woman first. He went after Eve first. And once he gets Eve, then he lets the woman get the, get the man. And you see that in a lot of these battle buildings. The men aren't the men of the house. They, they're not running the house. They're not the head covering of the house. It's the woman. Creep into houses and led captive silly women. Not Bible. I know Bible-believing, God-fearing women. No, that's not what it's talking about. Silly women. Okay. Uh, the Bible talks about a good, virtuous woman. Her price is far above uh, rubies. They're a pearl of precious worth to find a good, Bible-believing, God-fearing woman. They are out there. I know some of the men out there don't believe they're out there. They are out there. And women, there are some godly men out there. We're in the last days. We're in the last days. Okay. There's going to be harder and harder to see them. Some of them have fallen away. Sisters in Christ, brothers in Christ. Some of them are starting to fall into the three enemies. They're starting to go back to doing things the world's way. It's hard. But led captive, silly woman laid with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Lusts, the carnally minded walking after the flesh. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ever learning. They're always trying to find loopholes. They're always trying to find loopholes. Let's see if I can find a loophole. Oh, well, someone told me this book really isn't God's Word. There really is no Word of God today. So I can shop around, ever learning, shop around, study this book. Okay, it kind of has what I want, but not exactly. What about this book? Oh, that there's the translation I want because it tells me what I want to hear and lets me live how I want to live. It lets me believe what I want to believe. You see? You see? Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. At some point, brothers and Christ, we came to the knowledge of the truth, and we fell down and said, this is God's perfect written word. The plan of salvation that's in here is the only way. And we did it. We followed it. We didn't earn salvation. We followed it, and then we asked God to save us. And you know what God did? He wanted to save us, and he did save us. Now we're sealed into the day of redemption. But you have people that are always trying with all their might to find 
another way in. They don't want to go through the door. They don't want to follow God's instructions. Verse 8, Now as James and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Reprobates, fake, false concerning the faith. They're counterfeits. They're, they're just fake and false. Verse 9, But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be made shall be manifest unto men, all men, as theirs also was. Eventually, when you when you back someone into a corner saying, God says this, God says that, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? What's their attitude to God being the final authority in their life? It comes to light, brothers of Christ. It comes to light. So uh, lost people can do good things, good works according to the Bible. But I've said this before. I've seen men that are drunkards, according to the Bible, the, the lost world likes to use the word alcoholic, but they're drunkards according to the Bible, and I've seen men give up drunkenness because they choose their wife, because they're going to lose their wife over drunkenness. So they don't want to lose their wife, so they'll give up drunkenness, which is a good work, but they do it for their wife. They do it for their children. They do it for their health. I know a man that did it for his health. The doctor said, hey, you got to quit drinking. It's killing your liver. You have all these problems. And he had to give up alcohol because he did it for his health. And some don't even do that. They keep going. But I'm talking about men that do give it up. But you get that man that's saved and born again. Why did you give it up, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you had drunkenness in your past? Why did you give it up? To please God. To please God. Hopefully, hopefully that's the answer. To please God. Because God's word said it's a sin. God's word says it's wrong. And I gave it up for him to please him. And to live right by him. Because he commanded, I obeyed. See the difference? And over time, when you talk to people, Oh, I did this, and I did it. It might be a good work. But why did they do it? And they do it for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because He commands it? Or did they have other motives in mind? Other, you know, intentions? Okay. But their folly shall be made manifest unto all men as theirs also were. What's their attitude towards God's perfect written word, God being the final authority? That's always what, where they, you get them every time. They might line up here, but what about over here? What about over here? What about over here? And over time, they'll, I've, I've had people, I backed in the corner with the Word of God. They got so mad, they said that I worship a paper pope and that they're not saved by works. And they always run back to the salvation. I'm not saved by works. No, you're supposed to be living a life of Christ now that you are saved. You're supposed to be living according to this book. God has a set life for a saved sinner. Are you living it? And if you're not, we're supposed to correct. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We learn how to live right according to God. And we learn how to correct people who aren't living right. And we learn how to rebuke people that refuse to take correction. It's there. Okay. John 10.1. Turn to John 10.1. John 10, 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. When you got people trying to find another way, they don't want to do things God's way. They want to find another way. They're a thief and a robber. But, the, but he that entereth in the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Entereth in by the door. And it goes on talking about how the, the people that are his know his voice. And then you've got hirelings. You've got fakes. You've got frauds. But the point I'm pointing out here is he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. We did a Bible study Way, uh, a ways back, where we were talking about finding the back door, question mark? 
That's what's popular today, brothers and sisters Christ. That's what we're fighting today. People wanting to find the back door. They don't want to go through the front door. They don't want to go through the door. They don't want to do it God's way. They don't want to come to God on His terms. So what do they do? They try to find some other way. Whatever they, they're a thief and a robber. What does that mean for, t for what we're talking about? They're trying to steal salvation. They're trying to force God into saving them. God ain't going to have that. Okay? Anything, anything to avoid repentance. Remember we said the first step is the number one step that they always try to, to skip. Anything but coming to the cross and throwing my authority on the foot of the cross, my freedom at the foot of the cross, my rights, my so-called rights at the foot of the cross, and say, God, my life is yours. I'm yours now. Command me. They always try to avoid that. They don't want to repent. Okay? The old man, the Bible talks about how the old man is dead and buried with Jesus Christ, the new man is raised with them. If there's no new man, you reject the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you're holding on to the old man. I ain't giving up this old man. Okay? The old man needs to be dead and buried with Jesus Christ, so the new man can live. But if the old man is the one living and thriving, the new man will never be able to live and thrive. You've got to come to the cross and throw the old man at the foot of the cross saying, My life is yours, Lord. Command me. It's not saying you have to change your life in order to get saved. That comes after salvation, but it only, only comes after salvation when you've sacrificed the old man at the foot of the cross. And brothers and sisters of Christ, those of us who have gotten saved God's way, we've gone through that door, we understand the ones that we're fighting are the ones that have just seem so clueless because they refuse, refuse to throw the old man at the foot of the cross in repentance. Once again, my way is leading me to hell. Now picture yourself, brothers of Christ, picture a castle, a huge castle. No, you can't use technology because people will always try to mess this up. There is no technology, it's just you standing there. There's a huge castle. The windows are so high up you can't reach the windows. And there's one big door in the front. There's a big signpost on the wall beside the door. And here's the steps that you have to do before you knock. Call upon the name of the Lord, and thou shalt be saved. The whosoever calls. Before you knock, here's the steps of what you've got to do. And you've got a man that walks up there and reads those and goes, mm, I don't like that part. Really? Yeah, like that's going to happen. <laughs> Whoever wrote this must have, must must be a comedian or something. You know what? I've heard that if I just say I believe, I can get in. So I'm just going to say I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Knock on the door. Knock, knock. Nothing happens. Hmm. He takes a step back and looks and goes, hmm. I've been told the whosoever clause. Jesus save me knock knock nothing happens and as that man's standing there imagine another man come walking up he walks up he reads that sign and he falls on his knees before the door just falls on his knees Lord I am a dirty rotten filthy low down no good sinner I'm on my way to hell, Lord. I'm on my way to hell, and I don't want to go to hell. I deserve to go to hell. Oh, Lord, I believe in your Son, that He died to pay for my sins, my filthiness. I should be going through what He went through. But by your grace and mercy, you sent your Son to die on the cross. His blood is your blood, and His blood, I believe, can wash my sins away. I believe that He died and rose again the third day, proving that He is God. It happened in the heart first, but we're hearing it coming out in confession. And the man sits there and says, Oh Lord, please, please save me. I don't deserve it. Lord, be merciful to me as sinner. Please save me. And he holds up his hands and with like just like a weak man, get able to get in one light knock that you can hardly hear. That door comes wide right open. And they grab him and pull him on in. And the door comes slam and shut. That's us, brother, says Christ. We're supposed to be a light. That man is sitting there going, 
He got in. Maybe that's not as funny as I thought it was, the, the list that's on there. Maybe it's not as funny as I thought it was. Maybe I need to stop trying to find different ways, or I need to accept the whole thing. And you do. I need to repent. And some people will follow that man and do the same thing. But let's say this man is really stubborn. That man was a fool. I know there's got to be another way. That man was such a fool. I know there's got to be another way to get in. So what does he do? He leaves the door and starts doing a trek around the castle. Now, this is a huge castle. Let's say it's so huge, it takes a full day to get all the way, all the way around. So he starts following the wall of the castle all the way around. Notice he's wasting a lot of time, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of truth. He's going around, he's trying to find a window that's low enough, he's trying to find some way to climb up. The walls are so slick, you try to climb up, you slide back down. And he's going, and he's, he's going around, and he gets back, and he comes back to that door with that signpost. This is the way. This is the way. Are you going to do it? No! That, that other man that did it, he was a fool. He was a complete fool. You know what? Maybe, maybe I missed something. So he goes around again. And again. Oh, there's got to be another way. And again. And you know what Satan does? Now we're going to bring Satan in. The world, Satan, and the flesh. You know what Satan does? He sees a man like that, and you know what he does? You know what I can do? Nobody's looking. God's always looking, but for this scenario, nobody's looking. He grabs some paint cans and some brushes, and on the far back side, he goes over there and he paints a door. And the man who keeps refusing to go through the door, as he's walking down there, he sees this painted door and another sign. Only believe. Okay. Knocks on the, uh, he, only believe, knocks on the door, and then Satan appears right there. Oh, congratulations, you're saved, and you're in. You know, I'm in? Oh, yeah, you're in. Okay, let's, let's, let's come this way. Let's go celebrate. And walks him away from the castle. What does the Bible say? He shall strengthen strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure and unrighteousness. Oh, you're saved. You got us. You get to go to heaven. You okay, come this way. And Satan leads them away from the, from the castle to the world. Let's go party. Let's go have fun. Let's celebrate. Brother, says Christ. Oh, there's so many fake doors painted around that castle. And people say, oh, I want that door. Oh, you're saved. Congratulations. Follow me back to the world. That's what Satan is. Oh, come. Congratulations. You're saved. Follow me back to the world. Narrow is the gate. Imagine that castle having door after door after door painted on it. It's a fake door. And they're told they're inside the castle when they're not inside the castle. Oh, I'm in. I'm in. Okay, yeah. Strong delusion that they should believe a lie. They're not in. That's what we're fighting today, brothers, says Christ. And it's hard. It's hard. People have a profession of faith, but they're not in. They've been lied to. They've been told they don't have to repent and believe. Repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. So we're not going to say believe and believe. We'll just say believe, only believe, only believe. They take repentance out. Now they're taking prayer out. You don't need the prayers to work. You don't have to uh, ask God to save you. You don't have to confess your wicked, wicked state as you're at the foot of the cross. And you don't have to confess your belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But the main thing is they don't want to confess that wicked state, that sinful, wicked man that they are, that they're on their way to hell. They don't want to confess that. So they take it out. That's another painted door. See, this one, you believe and, and you pray. This one, you just believe. There is no prayer. This one, you feel like you, want, you, feel like you should always earn your way. So this one, this door says that you have to do good works in order to be, or to get saved. To earn salvation. Well, that's what—that's the door. I will. You see what we're fighting against? And they're trying to find loopholes in the Bible. 
I've had people try to turn all everywhere trying to find loopholes to justify sin. And the number, way they, number one way they justify sin is they're always running back to salvation saying it's under the blood, it's under the blood, it's under the blood. Now, if you repent and forsake, that sin is under the blood. If you're truly saved and born again, you're not going to lose your salvation. No, no, no. But you're still going to have to answer for your life at the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible says, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, talking about Jesus as Lord, every tongue shall confess, then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. We also have to give an account of ourselves to God. And we know that, brothers and Christ. We're in, and we still understand that our life as a Christian, we still have to answer to God. We need to work. Lord, clean up my life. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We're supposed to have a walk with the Lord. And when you're walking with the Lord, that's the Lord commanding you, and you're living right according to the Lord, his word. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Don't do this. Don't do that. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Get away from this. Stay away from that. Are you praying? Are you meditating in the word, laws of God? Meditating in the word of God day and night. Now, for the, for the Jews, the day starts at 6. Night starts at 6. It's 6 to 6. Are you starting your day with the word of God? Are you ending your day with the word of God? Are you praying? The Bible says pray without ceasing. That matters to us. Brothers says Christ. And it's supposed to. We're in, but we understand we need to be living for Jesus Christ now. We got when I first got saved, I understood to a point that I have a lot of cleaning up to do. God started shining a light on my my life, and it was more wicked than I thought. And I still came to him broken, just filthy wick. I was like, wow, that statement really rang true when God shined a light on my life after salvation. He shined a light on my life before, but when it came time to clean up, I mean, you, you can see a mess over there and say it's, and you, put it to, you keep putting it off. You see a mess over there, yeah, it's a mess. You don't realize how big of a mess it is when it comes time to actually clean it. Then you're like, wow, I put it off so long, and man, this is a big mess. Lord, where do we start? Okay, start with that right there. Get rid of that. Okay, make sure you're doing this. Make sure you're doing that. Okay. Brother, sister, Christ, get a King James Bible if you don't have one. If you come across this, get a King James Bible. Okay. For professing brethren out there, get a King James Bible today and find out from the scriptures how to be saved. Don't look for loopholes. If you're one of those people that you come across this video and you realize maybe I've looked for a loophole, I was told only believe, it's only believe, only believe, and I never repented, get it figured out. Get it fixed. Okay? Don't be deceived. There are no clauses. God's not forced to save you. You didn't earn, you cannot earn salvation with your belief, and God's not forced to save you because you say, I believe. God's not forced to save you because you ask Him to save you. Those are lies. You come to Him broken. You come to Him on His terms, His way. And you knock at that door. And he lets you in. He wants to let you in. Okay, he wants to let you in. Galatians 6, 7 we read. Galatians 6, 7. Galatians 6, 7. I went way too far. Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. You know, these people are mocking God. This, that, that preacher that stood up there and said, the whosoever clause. God, he, he tries to pretend like he's God. And he's like, I, that man down there, he, he named his own name. That man down there, I didn't want to save him, but he followed the whosoever clause. Therefore, I have to save him. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap to his flesh corruption. That man standing at the, at the gate, that man standing at the wall to the castle, reading it and mocking 
what God says you have to do to come in. Mocking it. Laughing at it. Oh, he's, he's a comedian. Whoever wrote this is a comedian. Yeah, like I'm going to do that. He loves his flesh. He loves the world. He doesn't want to give up the world. He doesn't want to give up Satan. He doesn't want to give up his flesh. At the foot of the cross. For he that soweth to his flesh shall also of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. When you get saved, you're capital S spiritually minded, and you walk after the capital S Spirit. We stumble, we fall, sometimes we go to the left, sometimes we go to the right, and we don't stay on the narrow path. God chasing us, convicts us first, and we get back on the path, and if we won't listen to the conviction, God will chasten us to get us back on the path. But some way, somehow, God will get us back on the path. Uh, so to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be wear, weary in well-doing. Brothers and sisters Christ, never get weary. That's what I see going on, the falling away. Brethren are looking out there, they're seeing the world, they're seeing these professing Christians... And they're seeing the life that, why do they get to have that life? Why are they getting away with that? Why are they doing the, and let not, let us not be weary in well-doing. Brothers and sisters of Christ, ignore them. Focus on the, your walk with the Lord. Focus on His Word and living for Him. God will deal with them in due time. It might look like they're getting away with it now. It might look like they're having fun and you don't get to have fun. Fun is flesh. What does it say? And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if, there's a Bible if, we faint not. Brothers of Christ, the Bible talks about the house. God knows them that are His. God knows them that are His. Those who followed His way and knocked at that door. He knows those that are actually inside the castle versus those that are claiming to be inside the castle, outside the castle. God knows them that are His. In the house of God, there is uh, silver and gold, wood and, and earth. Some to honor, some to dishonor. We shall reap if we faint not. Some people are fainting, brother says Christ. They're fainting. They're bringing in culture, heritage, traditions of men. They're turning things of this world into lowercase g gods where that this world comes before God Almighty and His Word. Things down here are more important than things up there. I see it, brothers and sisters. Let us not be weary in well-doing, looking for that blessed hope. It's a lifelong process. Jesus might not come back in my lifetime, but I'm to live as if he could. Pardon me. Excuse me. But I'm to live as if he could. And I'm to keep my eyes on Jesus Christ. But what happens? People are trying to get your eyes off Jesus Christ and get it on the world. Satan and the flesh. And what I mean by Satan is Satan starts offering you things. Starts whispering in your ear. You look at the world and you see how the world... Oh, they're just having so much fun. Can't I have a little bit of fun? The flesh. Oh, come on. I want this. And I want... Like a little baby. I want this. I want that. Man, man, man. you got to put the flesh down. And let us not be weary and well doing. Stay the course, brother says Christ. Stay the course. Turn to Colossians 3. We're going to end it with Colossians 3. Turn to Colossians 3. Colossians 3, 1 through 17. Let this be encouragement with everything we just talked about. Don't be deceived. If you come across this video, and you're a professing brethren, and you've been deceived that God has to save you for any reason whatsoever, you need to come to Him broken and get your heart right with the Lord. Get your heart right, get it fixed, get it figured out now. Okay? I'm not saying everyone's lost. I'm not saying everyone's saved. I'm saying you need to get with the Lord, and you need to get it with His Word, and do things God's way, and come to Him on His terms. Get it figured out, brothers and sisters Christ. Okay? This is for an encouragement for the brethren who have followed God's word and done things God's way. Right. If, now it's got to stop on the first word, if, here's a Bible if. 
No, 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 he has. Uh, he's guaranteed to save me and I don't have to do anything. If. You don't have to earn salvation. You can't earn salvation. But I'm talking about as a saved sinner. The life changes. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. You know a good sign of someone is truly saved and born again? Their eyes are on Jesus Christ. Where's Jesus Christ sitting? In my Father's house there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus is in heaven preparing a place for us. Are you eyes on heaven? By, uh, Jesus talks about rewards in heaven. Paul talks about rewards in heaven. That our home is there. Paul talks about being absent from the body, present with the Lord. It's our hearts and our minds, our eyes, I'm sorry, our hearts and our eyes, are, are we looking for Jesus Christ? Are we seeking things that are above? Are you looking, present tense, for that blessed hope? Or have you been deceived by some man into turning your back on him? Loving that great appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Nah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it off. If you love it, you're not going to put it off. But there are men putting it off. Oh, he's not coming for another five or ten years, five years, eh, five, six, seven years. I can just enjoy down here, and I can focus on down here. They take their eyes off Jesus Christ. If then ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Old man's dead and buried. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Fight the good fight. Don't get weary in well-doing, which we read in that other passage. Don't get weary in well-doing. Keep the fighting. Keep the faith. Don't faint. Don't falter. Why? Because Jesus is coming back someday. He can come back any day now. He can come back while I'm doing this video. You can get caught up in death any day now. Right when I'm doing this video, I can get caught up in death. If God says enough's enough, you've done good, come home. You fought the good fight, come home. Mortify, therefore, your members. Like I said, we put the flesh down. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, incordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which sake... Actually, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the child, children of disobedience, and the which ye also walk sometimes when ye lived in them, past tense. Oh, there doesn't have to be a change, past tense. But now ye also put off all these anger, not just this stuff up there, okay, about uh, fornication, uncleanness. That stuff doesn't just get put off. He says, but now you also put off all these. Anger. Do we see the body of Christ getting angry without a cause? Fighting, the backbiting, the whispering, bearing false witness, the drama. But now you also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another. Seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. The old man is dead and buried with Jesus Christ. Paul always warned us that there are some brethren that get falling so far, they're so far fallen down, that they start trying to resurrect the old man. It's not that, hey, I failed this, I fell, fell back into this, I shouldn't have done this, God gets you back on it. It's a struggle with the flesh. There are some that are falling away to the point where they like the fallen state and they're trying to resurrect the old man. And Paul's always warning against it. Don't be like that, brother and sister Christ. Don't be resurrecting the old man and woman. Don't start trying to become your own final authority again like you were before you were saved. Don't give your flesh the final authority like it had before you were saved. Don't give the world the final authority like it had before you were saved. And definitely don't give Satan the final authority like Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Don't give Satan the final authority like you did before you were saved. Make sure you're making sure that God is your final authority through his perfect written word. 
Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. We keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Talk about saved. But put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. That seems to be hard in the body of Christ today, Brother Spice is forgiving one another. A lot of people holding grudges. A lot of people trying to. Uh, um, Bitterness, holding bitterness in their heart towards other brethren. Now, there's, there's a difference between me saying, hey, that brother's fake and false. But I'm talking about between the brethren. That's a wolf in sheep's clothing. I'm talking about between the brethren. I'm noticing this. Having a hard time forgiving one another. Fellowships are falling apart and, and breaking up. Or things that's not worth breaking fellowship over. Repent. If you did something wrong, apologize. If the brother apologizes, forgive him. Don't hold on to it. Don't let it turn into bitterness and start festering up inside. But forgiving one another, if any man have quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity. Charity is self-sacrifice. Today they're trying to destroy what charity is. There's people professing to be Bible-believing, God-fearing men that are trying to destroy what true charity is. It's self-sacrifice. It's you giving up something of yourself for someone else. Charity, remember, charity is what we do for other people. What we do for the Lord, what we do for other people around us. Lord, you say I have to give this up, it's yours. Sacrifice is your all on the sacrifice, altar of sacrifice laid. A brother in Christ needs this, well, I could get me a toy, or I could do this, but instead I'm going to help this brother out and I make a sacrifice. True charity is what we do. Liberty, whole another study, liberty is what Jesus Christ did for us. Don't confuse the two. They're not the same. There are brethren out there that have turned from the truth. They once taught the truth, but now they're turning from it. And they're perverting what liberty is, uh, charity is. And they're perverting what liberty is. Charity is what we do. Liberty is what God did. Charity. Above all these things, put on charity. We need to have self-sacrifice. Why? Because we're supposed to keep our eyes up there, not down here. It's not about what I want down here. Living a dream life. Like what I say. It's living a dream wife. Having a dream wife. Dream husband. Dream children. Having all the toys that you want. Fun. Flesh. It's not about down here. It's about up there. So what we have down here, we sacrifice for the Lord. Men who get in ministry, you end up sacrificing living a dream life for the Lord to be in ministry, full-time ministry. Some men have had to uh, sacrifice getting married to be in full-time ministry. Right? To be a servant to the brethren. Brothers and sisters Christ, that you are sacrificing to be a servant one to another. When you get married, people that are married have testimonies where they've had to make have charity for one another, doing sacrifices for the other in marriage. Charity. It's a bond of perfectness. Why? Because it's not about me, myself, and I. And there's brethren who have turned charity into me, myself, and I. I don't want to go into that too much. The whole point of this is to change life. Before I was saved, it was about me and myself and I. I did nice things for people. I gave some money to poor, uh, poor people before. But uh, true charity came in after I got saved. And let the peace, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. That's why I say grace and peace at the end of all my videos. Grace and peace. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts that comes from His grace. That He has for you, then you have peace in this world. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, 
to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. We went through the verses. You're supposed to hide God's word in your heart. You meditate on it night and day. You live it. Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom. How do you know if the word of God dwells in somebody? Are they living it? Anybody can quote scripture, don't get me wrong. But are they living it? Maybe you can quote scripture, brother says Christ. I can quote scripture, but I have to ask myself sometimes, Lord, am I living for you? And you do uh, communion and you start going through your life for Jesus Christ. Am I living for Jesus Christ? That's what communion is. It's about checking your life and see if it lines up with this book. Is there any cleanup I need to do? All right. It's a wake-up call. Richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. I had a blackout earlier, and the Lord blessed me. I was like, I was getting frustrated because I really want to get this study done, and I want to do this later, and I want to do this, and the Lord's like, blackout time. What I did is I went and grabbed my hymn book. I started walking around the house and just started singing some hymns. Calm me down. You know, sometimes we sometimes we have things set up, this is how we want it, but God's like, eh, blackout. No video, no nothing. Just spend some time with me. Walk with me. Talk with me. Sing some hymns. And we sung some hymns. I sung hymns with the Lord for a while. Until the power came back on. Power was out for like 30 minutes. Verse 17. And whatsoever ye do in word or in deed, do all to the name of the Lord Jesus. This goes back to our study, brothers and Christ. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our motivation. Why do we do what we do, brother says Christ? We do it for the Lord. And when we are not lining up with this book, then you have to ask yourself, who am I doing it for? The flesh? The world? Satan? Those are the three options. You're either doing it for the Lord, or you're doing it for one of the three enemies. It's supposed to be the enemy. They weren't when you were lost, but they are now. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Brothers and sisters of Christ, don't give up. Stand for this book. Fight, fight, fight. Okay? And if you've come across this video and you've fallen for the whosoever clause or the belief clause, you need to get your heart right with the Lord. You need to come to Him broken. You need to get it figured out. You need to get saved God's way. So I'm going to end this study with grace and peace. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, my brother and sister Christ, especially in these last days. Especially in these last days. And my love for you, I'm doing this and preaching this out of love. My love for the Lord, my love for His Word, and my love for you, brothers and sisters of Christ. My love for you, which is in, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next study.